Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the TNT pre-show, uh, season two, episode five, sponsored by HSBC Bank Canada. This is your opportunity to check your audio and check your video and settle in for the next 45 to 50 minutes of stimulating cultural discourse. COVID-19 is still upon us in BC, Canada, and the world. And I would all encourage everyone out there to stay in your bubble and be safe. So we're gonna have another first for TNT. We have a commercial. Let's go full screen with me. And that first commercial, we're going to advertise our COVID-19 masks. So we have these beautiful masks uh, by local artists. In addition to, we have our own custom Emily Carr mask, as well as uh, some beautiful Northwest Coast form line designs. In addition, we have filters that go into these masks to make them extra safe. So go to odaneartmuseum.com for all your mask shopping needs. Okay. So, we're still in the pre-show. Uh, the museum is open to the public every Thursday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And here at the O'Dane Art Museum, we're taking every precaution to keep our visitors safe as well as our staff. So please respect the current BC health order that's in place till February 5th, which is this Friday. All right, everyone, we're going to go live, and we'll see me on a big full screen. There we are. Okay, welcome, everybody, to Tuesday Night Talk, sponsored by HSBC Bank Canada, and this is Season 2, Episode 5. Uh, the non-essential travel ban is still in place here in British Columbia, and I would ask everybody to respect provincial as well as national health orders. Tonight, I'm in the permanent collection by the flashlights glow, and we're here at the O'Dane Art Museum in Whistler on the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillooet Nations. And we have a real treat this evening. This piece behind me, whoops, wrong way, <laughs> uh, by Dempsey Bob called Northern Eagles Transformation Mask of 2011, uh, rendered in yellow cedar. And this came courtesy of the generosity of Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa. Uh, also, this mask will be included in a major exhibition that opens here at the O'Dane Art Museum in November called Dempsey Bob, uh, or sorry, Wolves, the Art of Dempsey Bob. And it's a co-production between this museum and the McMichael Canadian Collection in Kleinberg, Ontario. So we've hit a new TNT record with over 521 registered for tonight's broadcast. So thank you to all our viewers that make this uh, endeavor increasingly energetic for everyone here at the museum. So now we're gonna go live to Terrace, BC to Dempsey Bob, and I think you're sitting in your living room. Good evening, Dempsey. Good evening. How's everybody? We're doing Hello, great. Bob, um, Taliban Clinkett Artists from Telegraph Creek, BC. And I'm, I'd like to recognize the Simpson territory of Kitsilas and um, Halem, First Nations. Great. Well, thank you, Dempsey. And um, perhaps we can just jump right into the discussion tonight and we'll bring up the first slide. Can you discuss the story behind this oversized mask, please? Yeah, I did that one in a, I was at a big gathering called Emma. And it used to be called Emma Lake, but it was a gathering of artists. And I was there with Lionel Grant. And we, he made a big mask too. And so I 
I made this piece. They had some beautiful yellow cedar there. So I made, I seen this piece and I made this piece and um, I roughed it out in about a week, I guess. And then I finished it when I got home. But how I got the idea for the merging into the wall was, I was, I was in, in uh, New Zealand at a workshop there and they gave me a small piece of wood and it was only like six inches deep and about 10 inches wide. And I got the idea, I, I put the center line on the corner of one of the corners and I blended the piece right into the wall because what happened was I had a three foot scale that I had to do it in three feet. And, I, and the wood was too small to make it proportional. So what happened was I, I just twisted it. And that's, that's how I started doing these pieces, these wild sculptures. And I, 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 I just wanted it to sort of flow in, just flow into the, into the wall. And, and it's really tricky because what happens, you're working with two planes, two planes like that. The side of the face is on one plane and the one that merges into the wall is another plane. And it's actually just two corners. And then what I did was I rounded the back to get the back in three dimensional. And when you think of it technically, it shouldn't work because you're only working with two planes. But I figured out a way to make it work. <laughs> and I came up with these ideas. And this part of the story of this one is the eagles that came from the north, came from our country. The eagles came down a long, long time ago. And the wolves too came, came from the north. And that's how I got the idea for the eagles. On this piece. That's excellent, Dempsey. And, and um, that torquing of the form, as uh, Sarah Melroy describes it, the curator that and Michael has really become part of your signature, and that you're able to, um, you know, ca capture that moment, uh, of that supernatural moment of the, of the transformation from human to animal form. Can you talk about how you render the eye? in this work as well, please? You know, like I, I had a dream about these eyes and I seen these eyes on, and they were looking at me when I woke up, like, well, I don't know if I woke up, but I remember they were just looking at me. And ever since then, I've been trying to carve them because they were so alive and they had so much power and life in them. And, and then I realize now, like, like when you look at this eagle's eye, it could be human. But what I learned over the years is that each face, each form, each piece has its own eye and you got to find that eye. And once you find that eye, it's like it's looking at you. <laughs> And it's, it's tricky, but you got I keep drawing and drawing and working and working and looking and looking until I get it. And sometimes I'll get it right away, but sometimes I have to work at it. And then I believe that each piece has its own eye and its own forms and its own shapes. And, and to give it that depth in the right places, that takes a lot of practice and a lot of looking. What I realize on that, art, what I realize about art is that um, you only see what you know. If you don't know it, you don't see it, and that's what I. That's what artists. Why we draw. Drawing trains you to see. And to feel and to and to to be able to sculpt it. You've got to be able to draw it because what we find now is the best drawers are the best sculptors and the best painters. And um, I know that you've been carving for over 40 years. 
And we're going to take you back in time a little bit, Dempsey, to 1974, to one of your earlier works uh, called Old Woman Mask. Can you speak to the origins of this piece? Well, I, I was going to school and uh, I went to the Kassan School, Gitamak School of Northwest Coast Art in 1972. And then I had to drop out because when I phoned home, my wife said, we're starving, we're starving. You got to come home. So I had to drop out of school. And I went back to work and I carved with Frida for a couple of years. And then I went back in 74. And that's when I did this piece, like we had a project, like we had to make a portrait mask, a standard nine inch portrait mask. And if we finished that in a week, in the second week, we could make our own mask, whatever kind of mask we want. So I did this uh, old woman mask. And I, I thought about, you know, like Grandma Eva, my great aunt and I thought about her when I did these. And then I, what I did was I put the copper on her eyebrows, copper on her nostril. And I used moose horn for her teeth to make them look old and there's abalone shell. And the copper is the symbol of wealth to our people. And the, and the abalone shell is for protection. It's also a symbol of wealth too. And then I found these, this, this uh, old wig and that's what I used on the, the gray hair. And this is the only oh. mask I ever really kept. I, I gave it to my daughter. And it's a, it's a beautiful piece that speaks to the origin of your practice. And we want to thank Gail Tozer for that photograph. Next, we'll move ahead in time to 1982 to this eagle daughter mask. And as you said, this is a, a formative piece in your early work. Yeah, this sort of this piece was sort of right around the the early '80s, and it was a time when my pieces started to change. Like like it got deeper, and I I changed the eyes started to change, and I started to see it different, and I started sculpting out like figures on on the mask, and um, using this blue and. People always said, you know, why do you use that blue? And I don't know, I just liked it. And then I realized like, like in the future that blue is gonna be really dark. Because if you start with a dark blue, it's gonna be black in the future, you know? So I thought I'll just, I like this blue. I just liked, I like that color. So I, that's what I used, I just. And next. Uh, we have actually uh, more sculptural works than masks. We have a, a frog and a bear, and they go together. And these come courtesy of Harold Demeter. And, and maybe you can speak to these two fellows. Yeah, it's Harold Demeter. Um, I did the little frog guy. I called him the little frog guy. And I used to pack him around, and I split that wood right in half. And then I, I did a I did a little frog guy first and then I got another idea for the bear, the little grizzly bear with the salmon. And so I carved him. Anyways, I put that little frog guy in the show in Vancouver and this this lady there, she says to me, she said, Well, that little frog guy is not Northwest Coast. And I said, Why? And she said, uh, because it's not a totem pole. And I said, well, it's not a totem pole, but that little frog guy, I said, he's Northwest Coast because I did him. And then I thought, <laughs> hey, it was funny because, you know, somebody asked me where my little frog guy was. And I told him, and he said, uh, he made it in a show called Land, Spirit and Power at the National Gallery. And that's where this little guy made it to. And I, I don't know where the other one piece went now. It's gone in somebody's collection, but it was a really nice little bear. And really, he was really happy too. But I used to pack them with children and I called them, they were like brothers. I called them, but that little frog guy, I, he was one of my, 
one of my really first that I started to really change, like from doing totem poles just into pure sculpture, because that's what our people did. They they were sculptors. They were they did pure. They did some of the greatest sculptors in the world, I think. Excellent. And now we'll move to a real signature piece and one that's very important called the Smart One of 1989. And this photograph comes courtesy of Dale Tozer. This piece was, it was, I got the idea and I drew it down really fast. And, um, and, and what happened was um, I was going to do the show and I kept seeing I saw this guy and so I just went outside and I just roughed him out really fast. And then when I was working on him, I, I was working in the basement and I had a small window above the workshop and um, the light was coming in and I went up to get my coffee and I come back down and before I turned the light on, I looked at that smart one across, he was on the bench and the light was hitting him from the top and he was looking at me really strong and I thought, holy shit, he's there, you know, so I just left him. I didn't change him. I, uh, I, I studied him, I kept looking at him and I, I let him finish himself like, and then when I finished him, I thought about it and I thought, Holy smokes, he was smarter than me, you know, <laughs> because he ended up exactly the way he wanted to be or the way he was supposed to be. And then I realized then, but that's the way he's supposed to be. And that's the way art's supposed to be. And that's, and he, he ended up being better than I ever thought. And then I think I'll be remembered by this guy. And then now when I look at him, He's his own self. He's 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 got his own feelings, and and I was just I realized now it was just great to be a part of him or his dad for a little while. He definitely has a life of his own. That's most definitely. And so, yeah, in addition, one, one more thing: like this smart one was the keeper of the stories, and he was he was trained by. The elders, he lived with the elders, and he 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 could tell the history word for word. And if he couldn't do it, he couldn't be the smart one. And like if there was a dispute between the clans or the families, once he spoke in the feast, it was the law because he knew. And and that's why they call him the smart one. And my grandfather told me that about this guy. And I thought about it one day, I thought, who's gonna know there was this guy called the smart one? So that's how this guy came out, and that's 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 why I did it. Well, thank you. That's it's a wonderful explanation of this piece. So, in addition to carving Dempsey, you've done some graphic work, and we're going to bring up a a print here from 1983. And can you talk about this wolf? I seen this one. I was leaving Telegraph. I was teaching up there. That's my home village and um, teaching the kill children drawing and painting and we were making blankets and anyways when I was leaving the sun was going down and it was really beautiful our land and over the mountains and and I seen this I seen this wolf on that sun and so I that's where I got this idea and I, I drew them all out and then when I went back home, I, I gave it to the elders. I gave to our people, the, the wolf people, I gave them this print. Excellent. Now, uh, I know Dempsey that you have sketchbook after sketchbook after sketchbook where you, you know, as you said, you have to be good at drawing to be able to be a good carver. Uh, in addition to the drawings in your sketchbooks, you have a lot of inspirational notes and we're just going to bring up a couple of pages from a sketchbook you were kind enough to lend me. Yeah, I, I, I draw all the time, not all the time, but, but when I get into it, I draw, I could draw all day sometimes. But what happens, like when I get an idea, I'll sketch it out and really fast. And, 
try to get some movement in it. And then what I do is I'll think about it and I'll sort of develop my ideas. And then words come to me too, like, you know, things I've learned, things I've seen, like teaching and, you know, like, like one time, um, I realized, you know, how important your sight is and, and seeing, really seeing. And I think artists, they train themselves to see by drawing, drawing, and drawing. And, and myself, that's what I try to do. And then I, I, I believe that even a small idea, you could always develop it or you could use it somehow in, in some other way. And so I always keep these drawings and I look at them and I'll, I'll get ideas from them too. But words come to me too, like, like you know, like, like one time when I was leaving my village, you know, um, these words came to me like a poem and it, was, it said, um, the voices of our ancestors are thundering over the trees, trying to make us see. And, you know, like, I realized that, you know, like in the art, you can't just know art. It has, you have to know about life too. And you gotta know, because art, art is life, you know? And because what happens is like, if you have to express it. If you, if you don't know it, how are you gonna express it? And if you can't see it, it's like you're blind. So that's why I really stress the drawing and drawing and learning. Because when you stop learning, you stop being an artist. And that's what I know excellent. for sure. That's excellent advice. And the next image we have um, is a beautiful piece called, uh, it's a chief's uh, wolf hat of 1995. And it comes, this image comes courtesy of Rachel Topham photography. Can you talk to this work, please, Dempsey? Yeah, these these hats were like chief's hats. And this one is a wolf chief's hat. And I made the teeth out of um, a perculum shell. And what I did was I hollowed that head too. And I went in through the, through the nostril to get that nose out. And I went in the mouth, under the mouth to get to get as much weight off of it. Because, he, you know, like my teacher said, you know, like if you're making a hat, it's got to feel like a hat. And he said, if you're making a bowl, it's got to be delicate and it's got to feel like a bowl. And he said, you can't make it feel like a barge, he said. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> that our, our bowls felt like a barge, you know. So <laughs> the red cedar, I thinned it wherever I can. But our people did it too, because it's also not only for the weight, it was for keeping it from cracking. So this red cedar is one of our main, our main carving woods. And we use it for certain things. It's a really beautiful wood. And this work, as well as uh, some prints, drawings and masks, as I said earlier, are all gonna be part of a major exhibition here in November called Wolves the art of Dempsey Bob. And as I said, we're doing this as a co-production with the McMichael in Kleinberg. Next, we move to a Bentwood box, also in the same private collection in West Vancouver. And can you just talk about how you spread the imagery around this uh, rectilinear shape, please? Okay, uh, the image on the right is, you can see the beak is right on the corner of the box. I put the center line on the corner and you can see the eagle's beak and there's a little human on the bottom. And then the eagle's eyes, and then you can see his hands, his claws are coming around the side of the little guy's face. And I did this one different by using the blue as fillers. Because usually it's usually just black and red, but I used the blue to accent it and give it a different look. And then on the back part is his wing it comes up the top of the back there. And then there's humans, there's a human face on the bottom with a beak. That's an eagle, little eagle, young eagle's beak. I, I've, done, I've done a lot of boxes and I've done a lot of um, 
you know, flat designs, two dimensional designs too. But you know, like I learned, I learned like how to do these, like teaching in Alaska. Because one time Frida, you know, she 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 sent us up there to teach. Because um, I realize now that's how I did my homework by drawing with the students over and over and over. Also carving all these things. Like I do a workshop up there and we'd make 17 bent boxes and then we'd paint them and some of them would carve them too. That's a great reference to a major figure in the artistic scene in, in, in British Columbia, Frida Deesing. And in fact, the museum just recently acquired an old woman mask by Frida. And uh, as you know, Dempsey, the school that you founded up there in Terrace is also named after Frida D. Singh. Next, we're gonna move to an Eagle's chief robe. Again, on the subject of the Eagle, can you, can you speak to the design of this work? Yes, I did with my sister, uh, Linda Bob. And I did the cutting, I did the design, I drew out the design and I cut the design and, and then, then we worked together on shapes and how we're gonna do the fringes on this. But what we thought of this one is a cape, like instead of the black, the black and the red, the applique, the cutouts is traditionally done on the square traditional blanket. But what we did was we wanted to make a different for a chief's robe. So we, I painted the leather on the top so that the eagles, you could see the eagles on the ends and his wings, they fold down the front of the chief's when he wears it. And the, 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 the wings will fold around his shoulders like they were holding him. And then I did a little eagle face on the bottom with the tails coming down too. This one of our well, we did this one and we did a few of these, but I, I always wanted to change. Like I, I, don't, I don't copy things and I, copying makes me ill. So I, I'm always thinking, I was innovating. That was our tradition. That's great. And uh, next we're gonna move to a smaller piece and back to a, a carving and a bronze, these two killer whale uh, forehead masks of 1998. Yeah, I started in bronze and in the early 90s, I started working in bronzes and um, I went down to Boise, Idaho and there was a bronze caster there. And I, I did a few bronzes there. And then later on, I went to, um, I went to Italy and I studied there for months. I worked in the foundry there and I learned bronze casting. And the bronze is really, it's really, it's really different. And um, on this piece, like um, the fin on the left side is low, but the other one is up. What I did was I cut that, when I made the wax, I cut the wax off and I brought the fin up and we, welded it back onto the wax and made the bronze. Bronze is really Excellent. different. I was lucky to, I was lucky I got into it. And, and the next image, uh, you developed a very close relationship with another major Canadian artist, uh, Joe Fafard. And can you talk about, you know, the process of taking this bare mask uh, rendered in wood and transferring that into bronze and your relationship with Joe Fafard. Yeah, I, I met Joe and then I, you know, I talked to him and he knew about my work and I, I knew a bit about him, but I just didn't meet him. And then I found out he had a foundry. And then, so I went, I, I got my friend to phone him and then, and then I got to meet him. And then we start talking and then we start working together. But Joe's got one of these, this uh, bear mask too in bronze. And you know, like people say, why bronze? But 
our people, like the Klingon people, we we make copper masks and bronze is almost all copper. And to us, the copper was, uh, it was for protection. And so I, I wanted to see if my work would transfer into bronze. Because what I realized now is that if you know sculpture, if the wood is not strong, the bronze is not going to be strong. So what I did was you got to know sculpture. So that's why I've been doing the last, I've been at it for 50 years now. I've been studying bronze and learning about as much as I can about art. And you had an interesting story when we were talking earlier today about the kind of things that Joe Fafard made versus the kind of things that you make. Can you can you retell that? Well, you know, Joe and I, we used to, we talk about art and, and he knew so much and, and we talk about culture too. And I used to call him the cow guy, you know, because he made a bunch of cows. And he called me the mask guy because I made a bunch of masks. And anyways, the only difference between Joe and I was his, his imagery was uh, cows and horses, and pigs, and farm animals, because that was his culture. And mine was eagles and ravens and wolves, because that's my culture. And then I realized that's what culture is. It's what you live and where you live. And, you right. know, like, and then you're a great sculptor. And then on the topic of uh, eagles and bears, we have Eagle and the Bear People of 2013. And this is actually in Michael O'Dane's collection. Yeah, this is, it's, this piece is quite, quite large. It's, it's yellow cedar too. And I did a little human on the bottom and he's a bear too. And he's got a little bear on his chest. And it looks like he's falling, he's falling. <laughs> and that's a little eagle on the top. And the eagle and the bear, they go together. It's one of our stories about this guy taken by the bears. And that's him on the bottom. And on the top is the eagle. And plus there's an eagle in, in his ears is another eagle head. There's two eagles up there. The eagles, the eagles and the bears, they go together and they come from the north. Excellent. And then um, before we go on to the question and answer, um, we have one last piece and, and both these last images come from Rachel Toppin photography. And this is wolf, eagle and human mask. And again, you've, you've made some dramatic changes to the standard mask format and if you can speak to this piece which is also rendered in alderwood yeah this piece i i you know like i had this dream one time and i seen i seen a big mass base and what was happening was there was there was there was faces bubbling they were just like they were bubbling and changing as they were moving up the face and they went right over the top and down the back. And in the movement on the mask, I saw how the how how forms should fit on the face to make it real or make it look right. Like otherwise it looks like you just stuck it on there. And it has to fit, it has to flow, it has to work. You know, like I realized you could innovate, but you have to make it work. By making it work, I mean, it has to be good. It has to fit and it has to be in its place. And that's what I realized about these little faces. And then so my, my pieces started getting more and more intricate, more and more faces. And, and then it just went crazy after that. <laughs> and 
Um, and before we go to the Q&A, we're going to just look at a, a monumental piece. And this is a wolf pole that's on an, at an ancient village just outside of Terrace. And we'll go to the next slide of that. I Actually, I think I took this photograph in the rain, and that's why it's so dark. Can you speak to this wolf pole and, and that village and its importance outside of Terrace? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the village, Kitsilas village, it's a Simsian village. And I, they asked me to do the pole, the wolf on there. And so I did this piece and I added the head and I hollowed it all out too, otherwise it would crack. But I hollowed out that mouth too, really deep. Because I know if it gets wet, and, and it, it'll crack. And, and what I did was I, I really, been working on the wolf, trying to make it more sculptural, you know, working on the teeth, getting it deeper. And this piece is a very flat pole, but I wanted to sculpt it right out. And that's what I did with this wolf. It's very deep. Well, thank you so much, Dempsey. And um, we're just going to go into the, the question and answer uh, part of the TNT broadcast. And the first question comes from Carolyn in Pemberton. And she asks, how old were you when you started carving, Dempsey? Um, that's kind of a tricky question because uh, when we were kids, you know, we, we, had no, we had no toys, you know. And so we were so poor, we had to carve our own toys. And so I was probably nine or something, eight or nine, nine or 10, nine. When I started carving, we just had a little knife and we'd make bow and arrows and, you know, we'd make slingshots. We were cannery kids in Port Edward and there was no internet, there was no television. We drew and we painted and we carved. And we'd, we'd look in the Simpson Sears catalog, we call it the wish book. And we'd see a gun in there and we'd draw it out and we'd carve it and paint it all up. And then that's how we made our toys and that's sort of how I started carving. And then when I went to work with Frida, I got that good feeling again, carving wood when I was working with Frida and I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to carve. That's how I started carving. <laughs> And, and you'd mentioned before when we were talking that, um, you know, some of your relations kind of inspired you to become a, a master carver. Can you talk about some of the people in your family that influenced you? Yes, I'd like to talk about uh, my mother, Flossie Bob. And, you know, she used to tell me stories while we're washing dishes, you know, and tell me over and over. And then my grandfather, Johnny Sincoots, garlic, he was a uh, raven. And he told me stories. And my great aunt, but we called her Grandma Eva, Eva Carlick, and she told me stories. And she told me about my great grandfather who was a carver. I didn't know about him, but she told me about him. And, and my other grandma was Helen, Helen Carlick. She was my, my grandmother, Julia Carlick's sister. And she was a beater and she knew a lot of stories. And, and so she, these were the people that really supported me and backed me in the beginning because they knew what I was trying to do and they knew about the struggle it would take to get there. <laughs> so that's why I'm, very thankful for them and for Frida too and my teachers, you know, because I wouldn't, I don't know what I've been, what I would have done if I didn't meet Frida. Excellent. The next question comes from Gail in Victoria and she asks about, you know, where you get your wood and the different qualities of wood and what you use it for. Well, we get it locally, like I get the alder from here or in Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert's got lots of good alder, straight and clean. And 
we get the red cedar from down the coast here, down towards Kitimat, and the yellow cedar too, wherever we could. But it's like each, each wood has its own purpose. The alder is for our masks, our bowls, our spoons, because the alder has no taste. And it's a hardwood. And it's a really beautiful carving wood. And it gives really good, strong detail. And the yellow cedar, we use it for smaller sculptures and also, um, you know, like, um, small totem poles, because it gives really good detail. It's really crisp and it's harder than red cedar. Red cedar we use for um, totem poles, for canoes, for masks too. And we use it for larger pieces. Like each wood has its own purpose. Excellent. And I know that you've got a, a very uh, long standing connection to New Zealand and I believe we have some New Zealanders watching tomorrow there. And uh, Anne and Helen ask about your connection to New Zealand and the Maori. Oh, I, I went there in 2001. It's, it's a long story, but anyways, um, I, I was working in Alaska and uh, one of my relatives up there, she's, her name was Betsy Jackson and I was renting, we were renting a room from her. She kept telling me about New Zealand and you got to go there. She said, they're just like our people, you're going to see. So she said, you got to go there. She said, I went there and I seen it, you got to go. So I got, I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go. And I, and I knew I always wanted to go there. Then we got invited there in 2001. And since then, I've been there, I think, 11 times or maybe 12. But you know what they did for us was they challenged us. And also, they made us see our work in a different way. And they have very beautiful work there, very beautiful old carvings. And I, I love sculpture. And I love art, too. And... Um, I wanted to work with them because I felt this connection because of our, you know, they're, they're weavers, they're carvers, they're singers, they're dancers, they're canoe people, and they're longhouse people. So I've seen all these similarities and there's, it's incredible the, how close we are and how our art is similar but different. And what they did for us was they, it made me see our art in a different way. Because trying to explain it all the time, when you live in your culture, you take things for granted. But when you try to explain it and show people, and then you really understand what your culture, what it means, what culture is. And I, and I realized too that what they did was they, they kind of twisted it on us, but I think we did that too to them. But just to make us better artists, better people too. And, you know, I'm really thankful for some of the elders I met there and the stories I learned. And, and I realized like art is about life. It's about people, it's about culture. It's about good things and it's, it's universal. And I love their art, I love their sculpture, and I love their songs and their, their stories are similar too. And we're, we're just like brothers, we're, we're like brothers. I was just lucky I, I was there ready and I was there when I met them, you know. You got a couple of good things on the couch there beside you, Dempsey, and I was hoping maybe you could show, show those as examples of what you're working on right now. I, I did this piece before Christmas and then I left it, um, but it's an eagle. You can see the eagle's beak here, he's transforming, that's his nose. You can see his wings are on his arms and his hands. He's half human. There's a face here and there's little bears in the front, two bears. 
and then he's holding on to this guy here, and there's a little guy coming out upside down, coming out of the mouth there. And it's a it's a yellow cedar, and it's it's a sculpture. I've been doing sculptures like I've got so many ideas. I wanna I wanna put them into these forms because it takes too long doing three dimensional. So what I've been doing was I've been just developing my ideas. And this all comes from my drawing. I drew every line, then I carve every line. And I actually made two. And this one is the raven, the raven, little human. There's a human up here. There's a little frog. There's a little frog here. There's a frog coming out here and there's a little man in there. He's coming out of the raven's mouth. And that's the cedar bark on the back. Cedar bark roll. This and is gonna show us uh, how you carve it. I I use my bent tools. I don't know if you, you could see it, but this is my bent knife. We use I carve around the eyes like that. Our bent tools are, you could cut both ways, like you cut this way, you could cut back. We use a lot of bent knives for our finishing. When I started too with Frida, we never, we never used much chisels because we had no money, we had no money to buy them. So we had to make them. So we made our own tools. And Frida taught us how to carve with, with our traditional tools. And I think that was one of the best things I learned from Frida was to use the knife, to use the knife proper and the ads and to do my homework. Because what, what I did was uh, Frida sent us up to Alaska to teach. And then by teaching, I, I learned how to, um, how to draw. When I started, I didn't want to, I didn't want to car, I didn't want to draw, I just wanted to carve. But what happened was I hit the wall and I couldn't get any better. So I had to go back and learn how to draw. And it was funny because Frida was pretty tricky because she sent us to Alaska. And one time I phoned Phil Jensey, he's a great silversmith, goldsmith. And he said, you know what? He said, we taught for nothing in Alaska. I said, what do you mean we got paid? He said, no, he said, um, he said, all the pieces we had to give to those museums up there, in the places where we taught, he said, those pieces are worth now more than we ever got paid for, he said. <laughs> and he said, but we did it, he said, because Frida said to do it. And then after a while, he said, we did it for the love of Frida, he said. <laughs> and that's why we did it. And that's, 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 excellent. that's how I did my homework through drawing and teaching with the students. Because I realize a true artist, you cannot mature as an artist if you didn't do your homework, which means you gotta learn the sculpture, you gotta learn drawing, you gotta learn design, you gotta learn wood, you gotta learn tools, you gotta learn all that stuff if you're gonna get good. And if you stop learning, you stop being an artist. And that's what I know. Well, thank you so much, Dempsey. And we're going to end quickly just to give people a little taste of a major piece that you're working on now. And can you just, just a little commentary on this poll that both you and Stan Bevan are working on that is uh, scheduled to go up at the Emily Carr University of Art Plus Design. This poll here, I did the wolves on there, the wolves up top there, and the, those are the wolf people. And the wolf people came from the north. They migrated south. 
And then what they did was they brought their art and even towed their poles, their totem poles. And, and then what I did was I, I honored the, the, the basket weaver on the bottom. And then the top of her is the master carver with his mask. And the cedar bark rope is there. And the two little faces represent our people that came from the north. And the cedar cedar bark rope is 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 our connection to our culture, and to our land. And that's what that means. And the face above it is the is the eagles and wolves that came from the north. And what I did on the other side of this pole, I changed everything. I did a woman, just a woman, with the eagle on her. It's, well, thank um, you, Dempsey. Okay. And oh, sorry. And uh, that's where we're going to wind up today. And I want to say, Dempsey, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, I think I met you for the first time in 1986. So we've known each other for a long time, and it's a wonderful pleasure to have you on tonight, as well as work towards this major exhibition here in the fall. I also want to thank um, the entire team here at the Odane Art Museum who have remained strong and optimistic in these difficult times. Similarly, I want to extend my respect and appreciation uh, to Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa for their ongoing support. And similarly, the guidance and contributions of both the museum's trustees as well as founders. We've got a few shout outs tonight. As always, my dad in Cornwall, my little sister Susie in Canada, uh, Kelly G here in uh, Whistler, uh, Harold in T Bay, uh, Dale, who supplied all those photographs, as well as Rachel Topham Photography. Also, a shout out to Eric Savix, who is a major collector of Dempsey's work and has been really kind in providing us access to his collection. Um, also, not to be uh, forgotten, uh, Sarah Melroy and uh, Jennifer uh, Withrow from the McMichael that we're working on this wonderful exhibition and tour for uh, this year and next. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't make a shout out to our TNT crew here, our director and producer, uh, Justine Nickel, as well as our quality control controller, Nadine Hassan. Next week, we have Attila Richard Lukash from Vancouver. And I just want to say good night to Dempsey Bob, also to Marg, and thank you so much for such an insight on your practice. Good night, Dempsey. I just want to say thank you to everyone and thank you to my family and thank you, Pi, and thanks for the thank you to the Maori people too. And the O'Day Museum and Michael O'Day. Thank you. Good luck. Good night. Good night, Dempsey.